side, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Last night, I made a grave mistake, a horrible mistake which I regret. And I make this mistake at least once a year, and I regret it every time. My cell phone asked me if I wanted an update. Oh. Step away from the phone when it asks you to do that. Do you know how difficult it is to adapt to the changes they make on your phone? Someone is paid at the big apple in the sky to earn their keep by making changes to cell phones. My, I love my old way it was done. So many of you this morning have already come to me and said, you emailed me something about Veterans Day. You emailed me something about doing this or that. Yes, how many people got an email from me at 1.30 in the morning? A bunch of them here. Ignore it. That was the upgrade. I have no idea why it sent out 30 emails that are old. Transitions. Man, they are Huh. But you know what? Eventually I get it used to it and adapt it and I like it. And then I make the mistake a year later. I can remember my daughter's time of pregnancy, a time of transition and the, and the struggle of childbirth. But McKinley is worth it. And all of our lives were transformed, and my family and my friends and all of us were transformed by the birth of my first grandfather. But transitions are difficult. The prophet Jeremiah prophesied that Israel would be conquered and taken captive, a prophet of doom at that point. And now, he writes a letter to those who have been taken captive and says, don't become revolutionaries. Don't become the Babylonian underground and try subterfuge and try to undermine the place that holds you captive. Jeremiah suggests something totally different, so totally radical. And that is, settle in. You're going to be there for several generations. You're going to have to pray for the city you live in. Pray for your enemies. Pray that they benefit. And any benefit that comes to them will benefit you. Does this remind you of anything that Jesus said? Pray for your enemies, feed your enemies, bless your enemies. This was a radical change from Israel's understanding of who they were in the promised land. Who are we now that we're not in the promised land? Now that we're in this transitional place. And you know the cool thing is, they adapted. And they reflected on their experience. O-M-G. That's a cell phone expression. O-M-G. It's very religious. <laughs> and I am so thankful on Facebook and on cell phones that I see so much religion <laughs> being passed down. You mean that we can have a relationship with God that's not tied to the promised land? Do you mean we can have a relationship with God not tied to a church? Except for the Episcopal church. Okay, just remember that. It's in the Bible. I'll find it somewhere. And I'll send it out on Facebook. <laughs> we can have a relationship with God that includes all the nations. Oh yeah, in our scriptures, we're called 
called to be a light unto the nations. And then, now here's the really cool part. And you're going to get a little education today from Dr. Dr. And after they returned to their land, they reflected on their experience. And out of that reflection of God and Babylon and the creation stories in Babylon, they wrote down an orderly account of creation that was radically different from the Babylonian story of creation and radically different from any other stories of creation that other religions came up with. You see, in Babylon, and they were there long enough to learn their stories, in their creation story, two gods got in a fight and one, one, cut one god in half, threw half the body up, and that was the heavens, and half the body down, and that was the earth. And creation for them was, was created out of conflict. Blood was spilled. Violence. And if you read the stories of the Roman gods, the Greek gods, they're full of violence. Lots of blood being spilled. And about using human beings and human beings manipulating the gods. But in our story, and in the Bible, this story that's written by what they call the priestly editors, the priestly source, which you can see there sort of organized. I don't know why I'm a priest, because I'm not really organized, but the priestly source was very organized. And in this wonderful poem of creation, in the beginning was darkness, void, and God spoke, and there was light. God spoke, and there was the sun, the moon, the stars. God spoke, and there were fishes and, and birds in the sky. God spoke, and there were animals on the earth, and God spoke, and then human beings were here. Our God simply spoke. He didn't have to fight anybody. He didn't have to kill anybody. He didn't have to spill any blood. But here's the powerful part of this great story of creation, which was written way after the story of Adam and Eve. Now, do you know there's two stories of creation? Because every time I ask who was created first, animals or human beings, half the room says animals, half the room says human beings. Well, in the first story of creation, which was written after the second story, am I confusing you? You're Episcopalian, you're used to it. <laughs> the first story was really written after the Babylonian captivity. The second story was, was told as a story of prose. The first story is poetry. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many science books do you have that are full of poetry? A, I've never seen a science book with poetry. And yet I know people that treat this poetry as if it's a science book. And then there's the story of Adam and Eve, which addresses a different question. Why have things gone so bad? It describes human nature. It's a story to help us, and it's really about children. Last night when Max went to bed, I went down and took a cookie. <laughs> he told me not to. He wanted to bring him to church. Isn't that the story of Adam and Eve? Here's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Here's the tree of life. You can eat the tree of life as much as you like, but you cannot eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then God walks away. What do they do? They eat the cookies. That's human nature. This is a, a wonderful, beautiful story, a simple story of human nature. Neither one of them are in science books. So they're here to tell us about deeper truths. Please, please delve deeper to the truth of these stories. And the truth is, God did not have to spill anybody's blood to create redemption, to create creation. But he gave and spilled his own blood to redeem creation. The 
if you learn nothing else this morning, know that our God loves us. He spoke us into creation. And he said, be fruitful and multiply. Love one another. Be companions with all creation. Care for creation. In the first story of creation, which was written later, can you remember that? Sorry to say, Wyoming, but sorry to say, Jim Shemar, who is a very big, carnivorous person. I give for your meat, if you read it in King James, I give for your meat fruit. Max, do not quote this to me later today. Max is so skinny, and he's trying to, I may as well have Maureen here, because he's trying to control what I eat, and how much I eat. But in the, the story of creation, God says, I give you the fruit to human beings. O M G. We're all supposed to be vegetarian. And to the animals, I give the vegetation for their meat. Whoa, things are out of whack, aren't they? I'm going to keep eating meat. Bless me, Father, for I've sinned. But I want to support the economy of Wyoming, so I think there's a really good reason to eat meat. Uh, could you turn the camera off, Joyce? <laughs> God created us to live in harmony. God created us to live in peace. God created a world where the kingdom of God, the lion and the lamb, will lie down together. The, the little baby, the grandbaby, will play over the hull of a snake. We will get along. And what we're called to do and be in this one little place of the kingdom is to love one another as God has loved us. And know that we worship a God that spilled His blood so that we could experience the kingdom of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.